So you were with the vice president at that point, in the very beginning. Right. So the idea of the reset, um, how do they go into it? What's the expectations? What are the hopes as far as Putin and Russia? Um, a, a big part of the reset, I think, was to try, strangely enough, to depersonalize the relationship between the United States and Russia. There was a lot of criticism that President Bush had made the relationship about his personal relationship with Putin, and there was a sense that we had to broaden the relationship, we had to professionalize it. And so the idea of the reset was really to break with that personal connection between Putin and Bush, and to basically have the whole of government engage the whole of the Russian government. Um, I think it's also important to keep in mind, however, it wasn't uh, just out of some sense that we should get along with Russia. We had some very specific goals in mind for what the reset should accomplish, and I would put those into three categories. Uh, the first and foremost was Iran. There was a recognition that we were not going to be able to put the type of pressure and sanctions on Iran to convince them to negotiate over their nuclear program if Russia wasn't on our side. And so the reset was largely about bringing Russia into our camp on that. The second was uh, the president's commitment to end the war in Afghanistan required us to be able to get lethal assistance through former Soviet states into Afghanistan. That was the only efficient way to make sure that the war ended. It was essential to the mini surge and then also allowed us to evacuate effectively. Uh, so the second goal was making sure we could get Russian cooperation on Afghanistan. And the third was uh, the expiration of the uh, START arms control agreement with Russia, which took place in December of 2009, would be a break with decades of arms control and verification, and we needed to get that agreement back in place quickly. And so getting Russia's cooperation to make sure arms control and verification and nuclear stability could be a basis for the relationship was a third building block. But was there also a, a belief that um, uh, dealing with Medvedev would, would be easier than dealing with Putin? Some people have the theory that we knew that he wasn't, he didn't have all the power, but maybe if we treated like him like he did, maybe he'd a be able to establish himself. Yeah, I, I don't think we were playing sides with Medvedev versus Putin. We always understood who was in control and who had the power. Um, we also understood that there were limits to how far Medvedev could go. But there was also recognition that he was the guy in charge. As long as Putin didn't block it, we could get business done. Uh, and the president wasn't going to wait around and say, well, you know, maybe we won't get what we want out of Medvedev. Let's not, let's not bet on the come. Uh, let's just cut deals now. And we were able to get what we needed, especially in the first few years of the relationship, from Medvedev without Putin blocking it. And, and we decided to go for it. So when did it start going wrong? And when did you guys be able to talk in the NSC about, uh-oh, it's going south here, uh, we got a problem? Well, I think we knew really very early on that this wasn't going to be an early relationship. Uh, I worked for the vice president when he traveled to Georgia uh, while the Russians were uh, attacking uh, uh, Georgian sovereign territory. And so we knew that this was not going to be uh, some love fest and a meeting between liberal democracies. Uh, there was always the sense that we should agree where we could agree, uh, that we should uh, get business done where we could. And where we disagreed, we would point at that. Um, but we didn't want to add uh, fuel to the clear paranoia and the sense of aggrievement, and also the way that Putin was using the sense of America as an enemy as a domestic political tool. We didn't want to add to that sense. And so even where we had disagreements, uh, if we didn't see eye to eye on things related to um, uh, Europe and NATO enlargement, if we didn't see things eye to eye on uh, Syria, uh, we recognized that we could isolate those disagreements and still cooperate in other areas. Some people have come in here and talked about the fact that um, there really were no there were, uh, foreign policy. It was all domestic policy with Putin in a lot of ways. The, the use of the United States as the, the, the yeah. enemy that was needed. Sure. Uh, I mean, Vladimir Putin has made no secret of the fact that he views the collapse of the Soviet Union as the greatest tragedy of the 20th century. Um, he viewed the Soviet Union not as uh, a uh, dictatorship uh, and a totalitarian state that oppressed its people, um, but as a, cent uh, a center of strength to protect Russian-speaking peoples, uh, and that protected Russia through uh, the creation of the Soviet empire and its satellite states. Uh, he then saw, from his perspective, uh, the West take advantage of Russian weakness, uh, NATO encroachment onto or near Russian territory, and through what he calls the color revolutions, undermining of Soviet and Russian satellite governments, including in Ukraine, uh, Georgia, and elsewhere. So for Putin, the sense of America as an enemy or an adversary 
was not only, I think, the way he views the world, but he uses it as a very potent tool at home where he can say, I'm the only person willing to stand up to the United States. We're the only peer competitor. We're the only uh, superpower. Uh, and it's incumbent on us to make sure that America can't just dictate to the rest of the world. And that's a very powerful message for Russians who are very proud and rightfully uh, sense themselves as having uh, an important role to play in global affairs, um, but their economics and their declining standard of living, lifestyle, life expectancy is prevented them from exercising that. In the beginning of the, uh, in the Clinton administration, in the beginnings of the Bush administration, there was this attitude that uh, what the goals that we were working towards is bringing uh, Russia into the European community, right. into the world community. Had that completely dissipated by the time that the Obama administration started up, or was there still glimmers of hope? Um, I don't, I would say that the administration by and large was very skeptical of the idea that Russia was going to be a natural partner or member of the European family. Um, we recognize that Russia was an important power on the European continent, uh, could make our uh, policies very difficult. Uh, they could make our lives very difficult. They could challenge NATO. But at the same time, that we had some common interests. Uh, one thing was we wanted prosperity. We wanted trade. We wanted globalization. We wanted free energy flows. Um, these were things that also benefited, we felt, the Russian state. Uh, Anti-corruption was something that was really robbing Russia of uh, tremendous economic potential. We thought that that was something that we might be able to cooperate on, again, as long as we sort of kept uh, Vladimir Putin's inner circle uh, exempt from that effort. Uh, but in the end, uh, despite the clear advantages for economic growth and development in Russia, and I would argue also from their security point of view, uh, they made choices not in their own interest, but in the interest of challenging the United States because that was good politics. Let's jump up to 2011. So 2011, you got Arab Spring, um, and then you've got Libya. And uh, uh, these things seem to have uh, scared the bejeebers out of, of Putin. Explain what we were seeing uh, about the, his reaction to this, what, what we understood about that, and what, he, what, what we understood about his reaction to our um, involvement in Libya. When the United States was willing to side with the Arab street, was willing to let somebody like Mubarak go, our longest ally in the region. Uh, and when he saw how quickly Gaddafi was deposed, that it added to the sense in Moscow that Putin was vulnerable. And every time we've seen, whether it's in Iran and the Green Revolution, whether it's Gaddafi, uh, whether it's uh, in Ukraine, every time an established dictator or leader falls, Putin takes it personally because he recognizes it could be him. And when we saw the follow-on protests in Moscow after the election, um, that also added to his real sense of vulnerability. And we saw a commensurate crackdown on uh, other alternative political parties. Uh, we saw Putin really tighten control and build up the, the sense that America was coming to get him. And in large part, that's why I think you know we had to balance our security objectives with not unnecessarily antagonizing that sense of paranoia in Moscow. But, I mean, did we find that there was almost nothing we could do not to uh, add to that paranoia because he tied, in, he tied us into almost everything? And, and his like, view towards right. Clinton when, when she said uh, the statement that she, she said about the, the need for fair elections and right, all. Right, right. It's, um, it's one of these situations, there's still a lot of mirror imaging. I mean, we did this during the Cold War a lot, and it turned out to be wrong, and we do it now, even though it's probably wrong. I mean, we always think of the Russians as being 50 feet tall and ourselves as being unable, unable to do what we want, and the Russians think exactly the same. They think we are in everything and that they themselves are highly vulnerable. And the reality is really in the middle somewhere. We are not organizing a global set of revolutions uh, to make Western democracies in our image all over the world. We'd be very happy if countries uh, were to adopt liberal democracies democratic reforms, because we think that is the most uh, prosperous uh, pathway. It's the way that people can be the most free and, and live out their, their uh, um, uh, rights for self-determination, freedom, and economic development. Um, but we're not out to get Putin. We're not out to get countries in the former Soviet sphere. But when Putin sees them go, and then sees the fact that we do have uh, funded programs from the United States for democratic reform, uh, for information and transparency, for accountability, he views that as a direct line for American uh, imperialism. Uh, it's, in his mind, it's not that different to what the CIA used to do back in the 1940s and 50s, even though we have no intention or desire to overthrow Vladimir Putin or any other leader. So were there any attempts during the Obama administration to 
send the vice president or send uh, McFall or, or someone else or the, or the uh, secretary of state to over to have a conversation with him to sort of help define the fact that, that, that he's, he's misunderstanding our intentions? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there were constant communications. Um, you know, the, the telephone conversations and the personal meetings between President Obama and President Putin and President Medvedev during the early years were actually quite cordial, um, you know, very uh, informal, even though we were uh, willing to point out where we had disagreements and we tried to achieve our objectives, whether it was on Afghanistan, Iran. And there was a lot of good coordination, particularly early on uh, on Iran when we uh, st stood united at the G8 uh, and, and disclosed the presence of uh, illegal nuclear facilities in Iran and Russia stood with us. Um, but over time, even when we said, uh, look, our programs are not out to get you. We're not funding, uh, uh, or uh, you know, political parties in Russia. We're not trying to stoke a revolution. Uh, we we didn't expect Vladimir Putin to believe us. He has his own view of the world, and it's still not clear to me now uh, how much he believed and how much was just convenient for him to to talk about. Um, it's easier to talk about the United States coming to get him and use that as an excuse for controlling the media in Moscow, for suppressing uh, political parties, for closing down. Uh, human rights groups and uh, uh, groups that promote accountability and transparency because he can call them foreign agents and American actors. So when he comes back into the presidency in 2012, um, uh, how do you guys uh, in the White House view him? How does uh, Obama view him? Is he a different man than the man he had been when he was president beforehand? And how, how does it change everything at that point? Yeah, it, you know, I wouldn't say that there was an immediate uh, switch where we went from, oh, great, we have Medvedev, to, oh, no, we have Vladimir Putin. Uh, you know, we wanted to see whether or not the agreements we had struck and the, and the efforts we were making were going to hold. Um, but it quickly became clear uh, that Vladimir Putin was going to take a much harder line, that he was going to define his success by his ability uh, to create failures for us. Uh, and very quickly, they began to pull back on a whole host of things uh, that we had thought were um, pretty easy agreements. Uh, we had wanted to pursue new negotiated arms control reductions to bring the level of nuclear weapons down on both sides. The president made a speech in Berlin in 2013. Uh, Russia refused to negotiate and to this day has still never agreed to come back into a negotiated uh, agreement with us, even though we have several. Uh, we had information at that point that Russia was violating uh, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, a bedrock treaty of ending the Cold War. Uh, we tried to engage Russia on that. Vladimir Putin denied it and to this day continues to deny it. Um, so we saw pretty quickly uh, that there was going to be uh, really slow going when it came to adopting new agreements, and we even began to see an erosion of some of the cooperation we'd had in the past. Uh, is there, I mean, you've got also the, the, the statements that he's making about Clinton at that point. <clears throat> you've got eventually sort of coming down harsher on, on uh, the media as well as, right. as the demonstrators and stuff. Is, is there, is the, what's the view of that when you're listening to some of the stuff that he, he's saying, and, and is the reset basically considered dead at this point? Yeah, you know, I, I don't remember us using the term reset very much after 2010, 2011 anyway. Um, you know, I think that was a convenient way of showing that we wanted to try and have a different type of relationship, but it wasn't the defining feature of how we talked with Russia. It wasn't that we had to redo or reset everything. Uh, I would say that our defining characteristic for the U.S.-Russia relation was pragmatism. There were areas where we could do better and be more secure and more prosperous if Russia worked with us. Uh, if they didn't, so be it. And there were areas where we were going to have clear disagreements, and we weren't going to pull any punches just because we wanted cooperation with Russia in other areas. And so whether it was on uh, Syria, where we were beginning to have a dramatic divergence in views uh, and uh, the view that uh, from the United States that President Assad had to go, that he had lost his legitimacy, uh, and the willingness of Russia to back him politically, and then much later, obviously, to back him very strongly militarily, uh, was a sign that we were going to diverge in a number of issues. Uh, and then that all, I think, led up to what we saw in Ukraine, which then became a, a dramatic rupture in the, in the ability to cooperate. But in 2012, is, is there a feeling that, you know, yeah. we're, we're, we're screwed here? It, 
you know, we never just threw up our hands because the president was running for re-election and, and would win re-election in 2012, and he wasn't going to stop trying to deal with Russia and achieve what were very important objectives with Russia. So, uh, for example, Russia participated in the nuclear security summit that we had in 2012. They didn't participate in the 2016 version. They felt that it was somehow... Uh, uh, an American-led, uh, organized effort that really didn't benefit Russia at all, um, but they still participated in both 2012 and 2014. So there were still areas where we could cooperate, and, and quietly behind the scenes, we were still doing a tremendous amount of work on uh, cleaning up the chemical weapons in Russia, cooperating on uh, other forms, uh, global health security initiative where we're trying to prevent epidemics, uh, trying to promote uh, you know uh, greater globalization and economic development, but there were clear areas uh, after 2012 where we just couldn't go. I, I would also say that after 2012 or during 2012, it wasn't as if we stood up and said, oh, you know, President Putin has to allow uh, full democratic reforms to flourish in his country. We knew what was going on in Russia. We knew that Putin wasn't going to change his view and decide to let pluralism flourish. Um, we also recognized that we didn't have the ability to influence uh, the course of democracy in Russia. We had uh, failed at that in the past. They had chosen their own path. We were clearly going to stand up for what we felt were important democratic principles, uh, the willingness, of, uh, the ability of people to protest, to organize, to run in contested elections, uh, and for there to be a free and open media in Russia. But we also recognized that there were limits to how far we we could push that agenda inside Russia. The, the philosophy behind <clears throat> um, the, the president sort of referring to Russia as basically the JV team. Okay. Um, it, Actually, I think he referred to them as a regional power he called ISIS the JV team. Okay. Uh, we, but it was, it was similar in, yeah, in right. attitude and certainly right. the way Putin would have accepted it. Was that, was that sort, of a, a sort of philosophy that, uh, that was more behind it that this actually is a good way to sort of uh, either um, irk him or get him to move in some way, or, or what, what was that all about? Yeah, uh, I mean, I never had a conversation with the president about why he used that term. I don't think that it was um, uh, a signpost of a strategy. I think there was a belief, and I think it's true, that while Russia can influence affairs on the global stage, they are not a global superpower, aside from their nuclear capabilities. They can project power uh, into the Atlantic, into the Pacific. They can influence things in the Middle East and in Europe, um, but they are not a global power. And if you're not a global power, but you are a power, that basically makes you a regional power. And so I think the president was referring to them the way he saw them, that they largely were not an actor in South America. They weren't an actor in Africa. Uh, they weren't an actor in uh, uh, the Mediterranean. They were really a country that was able to influence the development in former Soviet states uh, in Eastern Europe and to a somewhat lesser extent in East Asia. And I think that's still an accurate characterization of what Russia is today. Accurate, probably, but also with the realization that here's this, you know, uh, yeah. former it, judo expert and, guy with a, with a chip on his shoulder right, as big right. as Ohio who feels that his, his, his government, his country has been humiliated by the United States. What's, do, do we understand the effect on, on what he's thinking and what, how that affects his decisions towards us? Yeah, I, I think we do. I think the president understood that. I think by 2012, it was clear there were limits to what our cooperation with Russia was going to bring. We still felt that they would act out of self-interest to do the right thing in places like Syria. Um, we never really expected them to for example, cover for Assad's use of chemical weapons. It's such an abhorrent act that we imagine a responsible global power like Russia uh, would, in fact, condemn those sort of behaviors. Uh, and that was clearly a miscalculation. Um, 2014, um, and I know you're, n you're not an expert on Ukraine and stuff, but what's the, the overall view on Ukraine? What, what's the United States doing <laughs> right. uh, in Ukraine, and, and how, is, how is Putin and Russia looking at it? So doing? I'll be a little careful here, because I was out of the government from 2012 until December of 2014. Um, but what I can tell you is we viewed uh, the, um, the presence of foreign fighters um, and uh, the, uh, the annexation of Crimea for what it was, which was Russian deliberate strategy to seize uh, Ukrainian territory and to destabilize uh, the Ukrainian government so that it would not become a member of NATO, it would not become a member of the EU, uh, and that Putin would be able to con continue to have it as a buffer state. He want, he'd prefer chaos uh, to uh, cooperation with the West in Ukraine. He would have preferred uh, for there to be a compliant regime in Ukraine, but he couldn't have that because Ukrainian people wouldn't stand for that corruption and influence anymore. 
At the same time, we recognize that the, the Ukrainian territory was not NATO territory. This was not an attack on NATO. This was a very different kind of uh, conflict that we were uh, dealing with. And there was recognition that uh, we had a limited capability and a limited willingness, quite frankly, to confront Russia in Ukraine. We could punish them for their actions. We could tell them that we would never accept them. We could try to bolster the Ukrainian state uh, so that they could resist themselves what was going on. But we also recognized that we needed to keep our powder dry because the last thing we wanted was a full-on war between NATO and Russia. And there was a concern that this could escalate quite quickly uh, and that Russia might try to uh, deal with any confrontation in Ukraine by expanding the playing field to the Baltics, to Poland, to other parts of the, of the European landmass. And the attitude towards the critics that would, would say that uh, you know, we didn't do anything in Georgia, and he, and he moved on and had, had no problem with going into Crimea. If we don't do anything in Crimea, uh, or enough in Crimea, that, 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 that you know, the other areas are, are going to be endangered. Sure. What was What was sort of the with a view. You know, I, I would have a lot more patience for those arguments if we had just said, you know what, there's probably nothing we could do, so let's not even talk about it. We spent countless hours in meetings with the president, with the cabinet, in the Pentagon, with the State Department, with the Europeans, thinking through, all right, if we arm the Ukrainians with offensive capabilities and we they end up using those to kill Russian soldiers, what will Russia do next? Will they say, oh, gee, this is too dangerous, we better back off? Or will they double down and will they put actual Russian troops onto Ukrainian territory? Will they attack not only Ukrainian forces, but American or NATO uh, trainers, which would be needed to help the Ukrainians understand and use the weapon systems people were calling for? Uh, that's a very quick way to escalate. So you could argue, yes, we should have uh, confronted Russia in Georgia. Uh, but if Americans had died, there would have been a call for us to respond very forcefully. That could have led to conflict in Georgia. Uh, the same thing could have happened in Ukraine. And while I support the rights of Ukraine and Georgia to uh, determine their own governments, uh, we have legal treaty commitments to NATO states, and we don't have those commitments to Ukraine and Georgia. And it's still not clear to me to this day, while I don't want Russia to have that influence and I don't want Vladimir Putin to be able to behave the way he behaves, why uh, the invasion of Georgia or the invasion of Ukraine is a strategic interest in the United States, with the exception of does it embolden Putin to take action in the Baltics or in NATO territory. And to date, Vladimir Putin hasn't taken action against those states. We've been able to bolster our deterrent. We've been able to deploy additional forces in Eastern Europe. Uh, and there is evidence to suggest he is deterred from crossing those lines because he knows that's where our commitment lies. Um, but of course, he came after us. Vladimir Putin thinks we've already been coming for him. So his willingness to interfere in our election, to try and pick sides, to try and uh, discredit American democracy, some people view that as an attack. He probably views that as a response. So that in itself is interesting, but then it raises the next question, which is if Vladimir Putin's already behaving in a way uh, that is a response to a perceived attack, maybe we should be trying to influence what's going on in Russia more. I mean, I think that's a debate that's completely missing from the American discourse right now, which is uh, if Vladimir Putin is willing to come after us and he already thinks that we've come after him, is there a cost for us actually doing so? Maybe there is some deterrent value in showing Vladimir Putin what could happen if we wanted to influence uh, d the direction of, of Russian politics. I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I think that's something that we have to be thinking about if we want to prevent Russia from trying to interfere in the next election in 2018 and in 2020, because I think there's good evidence that that's coming. Which led, I guess, the, the, to the part of the debate that we've heard about is that, that there were people in the administration saying, we got to use cyber against them. Right. We have the capabilities. If we don't show him that there is a response, that, mm. that even if it does up the ante, if we don't do it now, when do we do it? I mean, how yeah. healthy a debate was there around that issue? Yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't just put it in the cyber category. I think we have lots of ability to influence what goes on in Russia. Um, and there was a, a long debate about the extent to which we should be exercising those early. There was concern, and this has been written about publicly, the president was very mindful not to respond too strongly to what was seen as favoritism towards Trump because it would be perceived as partisan politics on his part to protect uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign. Uh, but at the same time, we did send very clear messages, that's also been reported, uh, to President Putin directly uh, that we know what's going on and we are not going to tolerate uh, the Russian government interfering 
in our electoral systems. We took real uh, valuable steps to insulate the actual process of voting. But I think it was still not clear, even in the fall of 2016, exactly how this influence through social media, through Facebook, through Twitter, was really going to affect the discourse. Um, there are many people who really thought this was going to be, OK, push a button, and there are 2 million more votes for Donald Trump than Hillary Clinton. It wasn't a recognition that the goal was just uh, d to discredit the whole election, uh, to throw chaos into the system, as opposed to pick one uh, district where Trump should do better. All right. Well, let's go yeah, back to Ukraine, sorry. and then we're going to go back up to the election. But it, it, how, what was the debate like? Uh, how vigorous a debate was, was taking place ab about the p potential of, of, of arming the Ukrainians? Yeah, with, uh, better I, I, weaponry? vigorous. I mean, you know, it was. Uh, uh, it went on a long time. People felt very, very strongly about it, and there were strong camps inside the administration on both sides. Um, it was very similar, I would argue, to what was happening in Syria, um, where there was a lot of debate about, OK, we could do this. What would be the likely Russian response? They might uh, back down. They might double down. They might move in a different direction. And every time we followed that pathway to as a reasonable conclusion, we believe we ended up worse off. Um, that put aside the normative value, the moral obligation. It was simply a security calculation that if we were going to arm uh, the Ukrainians with offensive weapons, we weren't going to be able to control those. There were going to be Russian troops that were going to end up uh, um, dying as a result. Uh, and it is possible and even probable that Russia would want to expand the conflict uh, to come after Americans or American assets in Europe. And that was a risk that over Ukraine, the president himself was unwilling to take. And it seemed like he was pretty lonely in that decision, or it was, it, it was the president. Who else was with him on that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't want to get into, you know, who said what. Um, it was clear that the Pentagon and key parts of the Pentagon believed there was both uh, a capability to go after and disrupt Russia, and that there was going to be a deterrent value um, for going uh, with offensive weapons in Ukraine. There were also European advisors who felt very strongly that this was important for NATO's credibility, um, for the credibility of the Partnership for Peace and the, and the NATO affiliation program. Um, but there were also people in the intelligence community and elsewhere who understood uh, that confronting Russia here had risks, uh, that it could go sideways very quickly, uh, and that it was also going to make it harder for us to protect our allies um, where our foremost uh, obligation lies. So in the end, all decisions are lonely. The president's the only one who gets a vote. Uh, Tom Donilon used to like to say in the middle of a vigorous debate, he would go to a cabinet officer and say, how many electoral votes did you get? Because they only vote for the president of the United States, and he's the one who has to decide these things, whether it's how many troops in Afghanistan, uh, whether we're going to war in Syria, whether we're pulling out of Iraq, or whether we're going to confront Russia and Ukraine. In February 2014, um, Yanukovych is pulling back from the EU with the agreement, um, and uh, there's demonstrations going on. What's the view from the United States about what's taking place and where we where we think it's going? I mean, it's chaotic, and you know, this was really uh, a, a level of protest led by the Ukrainian people in Maidan Square, and uh, nobody was really sure which direction this was going to go. And we were, I think, as surprised as anyone uh, when Yanukovych ended up fleeing from Moscow. Um, but there was a recognition that whatever was going to happen in Ukraine, uh, the United States had to be very careful because of recognition that if it was seen as being an American-led uh, toppling of the Ukrainian government, uh, that Russia could respond very strongly to that. Um, it was also were quite clear that we're not going to take credit for something that we didn't do ourselves. We obviously had been promoting democratic reform, transparency, anti-corruption effort in Ukraine for a long time, um, but that's different than advocating or pushing for regime change. But Vladimir Putin clearly saw it as an American-led coup uh, and led to a very strong reaction from, from the Kremlin. Well, the, the attitude that Putin had toward Victoria uh, Newland and 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 uh, Secretary of State yeah. uh, when we saw that happening, and then the the uh, the hacking of of Newland's telephone call. Yeah, we had seen Russian behavior like this and even more disturbing than that for for quite some time. I don't think anybody was surprised. We knew that Ukraine was an extremely important satellite country for Putin. Uh, when the government fell, we weren't surprised that he acted very strongly. Uh, we also viewed his reaction that this was an American-led uh, toppling as sort of um, predictable. 
Uh, it was convenient for his narrative. It was consistent with the way he viewed the world. And it also allowed him, quite frankly, to get away with some of the things we then saw happen in terms of uh, patriotic Russians coming to the defense of Ukrainians and so forth. The Newland uh, conversation being released, so this was something new, the idea of using uh, uh, wiretap material. Yeah, but you know, it, it, there are also uh, cases where Russia has released things or WikiLeaks has released things that turned out not to be true at all. Um, they were going to use statements by American officials um, as evidence of a conspiracy. Be quite honest, I mean, I, I, I didn't talk to Tori about you know, how she felt about it personally, um, but you know, most people in the United States government have a pretty thick skin. We understand that Putin is playing for keeps. Uh, it's not something that we welcomed. We condemned it for, for what it was, um, but we also were trying to deal with a very chaotic security situation in Ukraine and keep our eye on the prize. How, how potent was that his allegation that, that we were trying to name the new leaders for Ukraine? Yeah, it, it potent in terms of credible or potent in terms of well, when we're looking at it and we're seeing that they're putting this information out. Uh, my sense is that Putin was going to do what Putin was going to do. We were going to focus in on how do we help stabilize the situation in Ukraine. How do we make sure that it remains a peaceful situation? There was clearly the risk that the protests in in Kiev uh, could get very ugly very quickly. There was there was already violence and that could expand. Uh, we're actually I'm still to this day amazed that it, it didn't become much bloodier than it was. Yanukovych could have actually tried to, to mow down the protesters in a way we've seen in China and elsewhere. Um, but I can't get to the specifics of how the, the, the Newland call and, and the allegations by Putin played inside the government. So uh, Yanukovych leaves. Soon after, uh, little green men appear, and soon after, the, the, the country is basically taken over. What are, what are we seeing? It was pretty apparent inside the United States government what was going on. Um, nobody that I spoke with believed that these were uh, patriotic Russians on vacation going to protect Russian-speaking people in Ukraine. Um, you know, these were uh, active military that were under orders, and we were able to pick up on all that in terms of their movements, who was in command, where they were getting their supplies, what was going in. Um, we obviously were, were concerned about it, but we also saw that they were moving to the extent that you can call it conservatively, they weren't shipping in massive amounts of arms. They weren't flying fighter jets. Uh, they were moving basically, you know, small combat vehicles. Uh, and so it wasn't a, a whole scale invasion, which obviously complicated our ability to respond. Had it been 500,000 troops rolling over the border, I think then Europe, the EU, NATO would have had uh, some obligation to respond forcefully, not uh, in, in the way we would protect NATO states, but we obviously would have, I think, had a very different response. Um, Putin was using a hybrid warfare in a way we hadn't seen, uh, and we did not have an organized response for it, but we also recognized that he was attacking at a weak point. Ukraine wasn't a functioning state. It was a vassal state and a corrupt one, and there wasn't much of the Ukrainian army to work with when we decided to cooperate and to push back. Uh, most of what was uh, shipped to the Ukrainian army over the years had been looted, sold off, uh, the officers were corrupt, the troops weren't trained, and so you didn't have a cadre of people who could organize and push back against the hybrid attacks we were seeing. So are you surprised at, at sort of how successful, to some extent, the Ukrainians have been? As Vladimir Putin said, if he wanted to take Kiev, he could have taken Kiev. Uh, the United States is not committed, nor is NATO, to protect Ukrainian territory. Uh, I think Vladimir Putin wants a frozen conflict more than he wants to own and control Ukraine. Uh, because quite honestly, he can still get what he wants out of Ukraine without having to own all the problems, all the chaos that would come with it. Uh, he's destabilized the region. He's been able to seize the strategic ports on the Black Sea that he's always valued. Uh, and he's been able to make sure that uh, the region's going to be trouble for years to come. We're going to be tracking the hybrid war. We're going to you know, go from Estonia in 2007 great, great. and sort of what happened in Georgia. And, and now you, of course, got this hybrid war that's taking place in Ukraine. Did, what did we see? What did the White House understand about this? And was, was there an uh, evolution in how the White House was viewing what this threat was? Um, yeah, uh, undoubtedly. I mean, you know, for 60 years, we have been preparing for massive armored combat on the U European landmass. That's what we have been designing our entire army, air force, navy, and, and, and um, uh, military around. And so we did not anticipate, uh, even after Georgia, the extent to which Putin was willing to use these tools he had developed 
in Ukraine to destabilize the state and to achieve uh, the annexation of Crimea, the theft of Crimea. Um, so all of the plans that we had for protecting NATO territory against invasion, uh, destabilization, weren't really viable in Ukraine, in part because they weren't NATO states. We hadn't been training with them and participating with them. But also, this wasn't the scenario we'd been planning against. Looking back, there's no question uh, that Putin was able to take advantage of his weakness, per se, uh, and our planning against what we uh, had expected to see during the 1990s or before, uh, and to destabilize the region in a way that um, achieved his goals with a minimum of risk. Now, that also tells us something about Vladimir Putin and how much he cared about Ukraine, which is he clearly wanted uh, to make sure that America didn't uh, establish a, a strong ally and a NATO partner in Ukraine, um, but he also wasn't willing to cut off his leg to achieve it, right? He was willing to throw a couple of thousand nameless Russians um, into the battle. He was willing to commit some anti-aircraft batteries and some uh, armored personnel carriers and drones and so forth, but he wasn't committing the whole Russian army to this endeavor. Uh, and the question is, had we pushed back, would he have folded? Uh, or would he have doubled down? And that's something we will never know the answer to. Um, but my belief is, in fact, that Russia was committed to seizing Crimea. And had we um, gone with offensive weapons uh, to support the Ukrainian people, that this conflict would have expanded very quickly. When you hear about the Russian involvement in, in the hacking of the DNC and the Podesta and, and all, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, you know, look, this isn't the first time we've seen Russia well, let me rephrase that. It's not the first time we've seen hackers meddling with American political systems. Um, the White House is constantly under cyber attack, from denial of access to uh, foreign governments trying to penetrate our systems. Uh, you know, we joke at home that, you know, my wife and I, the Chinese know more about my wife and I than the American government does because of the OMB hack. So, you know, it's sort of a constant uh, problem in Washington and in people who work in national security. And we recognize we're vulnerable. However, what we were seeing and what we were hearing about the Russian attacks were really different because it wasn't just uh, accumulating information uh, for use later for potentially targeting or cyber. It really was designed to be actionable. It was really designed to use, to release, uh, and to damage both individuals, parties, campaigns, but also to throw doubt over the whole democratic system. Uh, and that was something new. Um, not working on it day by day was something that even now I'm not privy to all of the different aspects of. Um, but it was clear that, uh, for at least my point of view, um, that what we were seeing was Vladimir Putin responding to what he saw as American threats to his hold on power, uh, and that he was going to choose sides in an American election between someone who's been very strong on human rights and democratic rights uh, and the rights of people for self-determination uh, and the eventual man who won president of the United States. When did you guys start understanding uh, the complexity of the attack, the different levels of, of the bots and everything else. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think we're still learning to this day. Um, I, but I think, at least not as somebody who is primarily engaged in this issue and, and, and um, uh, protecting the American political system, early on we thought this was, uh, you know, more small-scale Russian hacking. Uh, that they were just trying to target and get information and then provided the WikiLeaks. Uh, I don't think we had a sense, or at least I didn't have a sense early on, that this was part of a coordinated systemic campaign to go after the American political system. I think even uh, up until the election, it wasn't exactly clear publicly um, what we were actually facing. Um, what did we think? What did the White House start <laughs> thinking about? What, what did Putin want from mm -hmm. this? There were different opinions, but I, I think the major concern was that uh, Vladimir Putin was putting himself in a position to where he could influence the outcome directly. Um, our real concern was on ensuring that you could not get cyber intrusions into the electoral systems in 50 different states. Uh, and we coordinated, not my office, but the White House and, and the people working on cyber issues, coordinated through FEMA and other uh, offices how to ensure that the states had the resources that they needed, or if they requested them, uh, if they didn't have them to get what they needed, uh, to protect their voting systems. We've gone to electronic voting in this country, but it's run by the states. The federal government doesn't get involved. But just as we help after tornado, 
NATO, we wanted to get uh, in position to help protect these systems. And if there were uh, compromises, be able to notify people uh, to alert the electorate to it and deal with that in a, in a systemic way. Um, but the primary concern was that he was going to influence the outcome of the election directly. Um, I think it wasn't until later after the election we recognized that that wasn't the goal although we still are now learning information about how the vote, the people who produce the voting machines actually may have been compromised and the voting rolls may have been compromised, um, but largely that this was a disinformation campaign designed to throw up a lot of fake news and complicate the way people saw the election, the debates in the election, and influence it that way. How big a debate was this within the White House? I mean, during the campaign and sort of seeing this stuff happen and, and, and yeah, I would want to be careful because I wasn't involved in any of the the political discussions and, and specifically in terms of how the uh, the Russian behavior was influencing the election. I viewed it from the outside, looking at how are we going to be able to achieve other objectives we were still trying to work with the Russians on, um, and it was clear why we weren't able to get the attention that we felt uh, these issues deserved. In part because there were other priorities like how do we protect the American democratic system from Russian attack. Uh, was it up from both sides that you were seeing uh, dead ends, or was it? No, I mean, largely from the Russians. I mean, every time we went up the chain to get either uh, Susan Rice's uh, support or the president's support, uh, in terms of how do we engage Russia constructively, how to try and advance our goals with Russia, North Korea, sorry, with Iran, North Korea, uh, on arms control, we always got it um, because there was a recognition that if we could make progress, even with uh, a President Putin that was interfering in our election, uh, the job of, of the American president is still to protect the American people. Um, but I, I think it from, from at least June on, it was clear the Russians felt uh, either they were going to get Donald Trump and they were going to get a better outcome, um, or they were going to Hillary Clinton, and anything that we might negotiate uh, uh, in the Obama years wasn't going to be relevant. Because? Because they felt that they were going to get a much tougher deal from, from Hillary Clinton, which, in my opinion, is why they chose sides in the election. They felt that Hillary was going to be much stronger in confronting Russia across the board. I don't know that that's necessarily true. I think um, Secretary Clinton would have proved to be just as pragmatic as President Obama when it came to specific issues in cooperation with Russia. Um, but the Russian perspective was clearly one where they weren't going to be able to do business with Hillary Clinton. Um, so we started talking about this already, but let's finish it up. Mm -hmm. So this, this, the debate over in the summer of 2016 about why the, 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 uh, the, uh, the White House did not react more forcefully. Mm -hmm. the, there were Clinton people that were furious right. with the White House. There were other advisors who thought we needed to do more. There were, were intelligence folks um, that were, were, were also on that side. What was Take me one more time to the debate that was, was ongoing about that and, and how, how serious it got. There was clearly a debate about how we could respond to this and how we could deter Russia from continuing to take these actions. Uh, it wasn't clear that there was any magic solution. Uh, we'd already told Vladimir Putin that there was uh, clearly uh, an unacceptable set of uh, actions, including interfering with the voting itself that we wouldn't tolerate. And in fact, he didn't go in that direction. Um, he may have had the capability to, but we don't have any evidence that he affected actual votes. This um, is the red phone uh, conversation. The red phone conversation. Yeah, a, yeah, yeah. We did send an we did send an, an action alert through the nuclear risk reduction communication system, which is the first time it's been used in years uh, to basically make clear that they understood the seriousness of how we viewed interference with the American voting process. And how is it defined? Well, I, I, I'll be careful because I'm not um, uh, at liberty to sort of talk word by word. Uh, what we focused on was that we would not tolerate any effort to change the votes of American citizens and the way they were tabulated um, for uh, election of the president. And that, um, I mean, the way it's been reported is that, that a cyber attack would be considered to be equal basically to an armed attack. Uh, the, I can't confirm the report. What I will say is that it nobody could mistake what we were saying, um, both the means through which we communicated it and the content made clear that we were not going to view interfering in vote tabulation as just another cyber intrusion. Um, that being said, it's not clear to me even now, had the President of the United States gone out and given a press conference, and he did talk publicly about Russian interference, uh, if he had called together the heads of Facebook and Twitter, uh, if he had gotten together with the heads of the 55 or 155 major newspapers, what in fact the United States government could have done to actually prevent 
Russia from influencing the debate. Um, you had bots, you had individuals who were even unbeknownst to them were creating content which was casting credibility on Hillary Clinton, on the nature of the election, on the mainstream media. Uh, real stories were seen as fake, fake stories were seen as real. Uh, and that's really, in my mind, what the danger is here. It's not that Russia already interfered in our election the way they have with others, but they can do it again. And we haven't begun to really appreciate exactly how that process worked on individuals, uh, on blocks of voters, uh, and how we're going to try and prevent it from happening again. And of course, the other uh, other argument that was being had, and, the, and certainly the Clinton folks believed strongly in this, and certainly people in Congress uh, were, were, were calling for it, is they wanted more information released right. to the public, to the United States public, so that they understood the ramifications of, of what was going on. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I, I, I'm not uh, in a position nor was I in a position to make those calls. I'm very skeptical that even if we had released information about the individuals perpetrating and organizing these attacks, um, had uh, we released uh, clear intelligence in terms of what was happening and how, that the American public was going to digest that in a way that was going to change the way they viewed the candidates. Um, you know, this was uh, a situation where even today, you have huge percentages of the American population who supported Donald Trump who think that the idea that Russia interfered in the election is false because Donald Trump tells them it's false and that it's designed to be uh, a, uh, a way for Democrats to explain why they lost an election. He says, even he says they should have won. Uh, and you have uh, all the Democrats getting together and said, yeah, Donald Trump is a Russian puppet, even though there's no direct evidence that he's a Russian puppet. So it's not clear to me how, and I would argue that it wasn't clear to the president and the vice president and the cabinet, how releasing this information, uh, disclosing sources and methods, providing all this intelligence over to Congress was going to change what was happening. Um, what we quite frankly need is an informed and engaged electorate that knows how to understand and digest credible news sources. And that's not something you turn on with the flip of a switch. And the point of view of the president for not coming out uh, more forcefully to, to explain that we were being hacked by the Russians early on? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the president did come out very clearly and say that we are being influenced by the Russians, that they are interfering in our systems. Um, but he himself has said that he was uh, wary about seeing as being ov overtly partisan, even though he clearly supported Hillary Clinton and campaigned for her. Uh, there was a concern that he would be seen as using the American intelligence apparatus to support one, intel one presidential candidate in a way that um, many people would have felt was inappropriate. The Clapper report that comes out in January, so that, that, was, that was the unclassified version, <clears throat> a lot of people point to that as saying, if we know that in January, we, we knew a lot of those elements a lot earlier, and right. some of that would have been very useful to the electorate. It, again, it, it, it's it's not clear to me that it would be useful to the electorate. I, I'm not in a position, it's not my job to make that call, but I respect the president's right to make it, uh, and I understood the reasons why. Um, that's why we elect our leaders, is so that we rely on their judgment. I'm sure, just as the vice president uh, second guesses himself, that the president second guesses himself on this, but uh, in the end, those are the decisions that were made. Um, president Trump, or candidate Trump beforehand, um, his statements of support for Putin, his, uh, his ne negative attitude towards NATO and towards the EU, uh, for, for a preference for Brexit. Um, w this is now your, your NSC hat. Yeah. Um, w when you're in the White House listening to this, uh, you guys that are dealing with uh, you know, our allies constantly, um, the message being sent, how are you hearing it? What are the worries? Yeah. Uh, about what you're hearing? Well, it, it's, it's actually still the messages that I get today. I mean, I'm still being contacted by foreign governments who want to understand what's going on in the American government because there aren't a lot of American officials put in place who can answer their questions. Um, but what we told them is that we have treaty commitments that are sacrosanct, uh, that even the elected president of the United States is not going to go back on NATO. He's not going to go back on our extended deterrent commitments to Japan and South Korea, uh, and that um, there are a whole bunch of reasons that we don't work more closely with Russia, in large part because Russia has decided that they don't want to move in that direction. Um, but we did field a tremendous number of calls of concern from allies, uh, and they're rightly uh, uncertain about what American policy is going to be. I can't tell you today uh, in the way I could six months ago uh, that the United States will always be there for Europe, that we will protect uh, Poland or Estonia or Latvia um, from the type of hybrid attack that we saw in Ukraine from Russia. 
I'd like to believe that we would. I know under President Obama we would have, um, but I'm not as certain, as certain as I should be. And the ramifications? The ramifications are multiple. I mean, uh, you're going to see a lot of countries beginning to think for themselves about what their security situation should be and be less uh, beholden to the United States. Um, you've seen Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, say, you know, we need to be responsible for our own security. Uh, there are even some in Germany who've said they need to think about their own independent nuclear options. Uh, the interest in nuclear weapons in South Korea has spiked even with the election of a left-leaning government. Uh, the fact that President Putin said uh, maybe they will have to pay the United States for the missile defense that we're installing there to protect our own troops uh, and that they should pay more for American bases there uh, has really uh, uh, cause South Koreans to question the level of commitment to the United States. Ironically, the country that's doing the best is Japan, uh, because Prime Minister Abe was smart and came to the United States very early, uh, sidled up next to uh, President Putin very cozily, uh, made sure that he was getting the sort of economic cooperation and flattery that he wanted, uh, and seems to have worked out a close personal relationship. And that's, uh, you know, it's not the way that uh, it's supposed to be. The United States is supposed to stand for the rule of law. Uh, I'd like to believe that people around President Trump uh, like Secretary Mattis, like Secretary Tillerson, like General McMasters, understand that our security is based on the ironclad nature of our commitments to our allies. And if that falters, American power is diminished dramatically. What was your experience as far as when the Trump administration came in, normally when an administration comes in, mm -hmm. the last folks hand off yeah. you know, the information and they give advice and they, they tell the, the latest Right. where we are schedule-wise with treaties and everything mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. What was your experience at NSA? So um, we spent a tremendous amount of time on transition. Um, it, it, former National Security Advisor Susan Rice made it very clear um, that this is going to be the best transition in the history of this country, regardless of who won. Uh, we didn't write our transition papers for President Clinton or for President Trump. We wrote them for the next president of the United States. And so we generated a tremendous amount of both uh, bureaucratic paperwork, but we also generated, I think, a tremendous amount of insightful information about what was going on in the world, the advantages and disadvantages the United States had in different parts of the world, what was working and what wasn't, and why. I held, personally, uh, three very long meetings with my successor, um, who took over as the senior director for weapons of mass destruction in the Trump administration. Unfortunately, there were only two people that were taking meetings from the NSC at the time, one of whom was my successor uh, and another person who was going to end up at Treasury, but they were taking meetings from the senior director for Europe, Russia, defense, economic affairs, East Asia. It was just they were inundated because the, the transition team for the National Security Council was tiny. It basically was General Flynn, uh, KT McFarland, and a couple of staffers, and that was it. Uh, only one of whom remains at the National Security Council. So unfortunately, a lot of that effort was lost. Now, um, the saving grace of our system is that about one third of the people at the National Security Council are political appointees, like myself, who were experts in their field, but are affiliated directly with the presidential uh, administration. The other two thirds are professional civil servants who come from the different agencies, the Defense Department, State Department, Treasury, uh, Commerce, uh, the intelligence community. So my staff that I hired on was still there. Uh, they're the ones that are the loyal uh, uh, officers protecting the United States government and staffing the president even to this day. And I've met with my successor recently, and he's been thrilled with the level of support he gets for them because they're true professionals. We've heard reports inside the administration that there was an assumption that Hillary Clinton was going to win. Was, was there a moment on election night when there was a, did it change your understanding of what the Russians might have been up to the, the effectiveness or the weakness? Look, I can tell you that there was a moment when I became aware on election night that Hillary Clinton was not going to win. I think the vast majority of people in the media, government, uh, you know, uh, intelligentsia class were, were pretty convinced Hillary Clinton was going to win. The numbers suggested she was going to win. Um, I don't think to this day we understand exactly how she lost when it comes to the Russian effect. Is that because of Russia? Is it because of Donald Trump and his populist message? Was it his willingness to uh, offend pretty much everybody? Uh, and was it Hillary's, uh, Hillary Clinton's inability to connect with voters? 
or was it the fact that Russia was really good at spreading fake news on Facebook? The fact is, in this country, we don't want anybody to interfere in our election. It's up to us to decide who our uh, elected officials are going to be. Uh, but we're in an interconnected world. And the fact is that other countries and other actors have been influencing us in different ways for a long time. What we have to do is be aware of it and be able to process it. And that's something we haven't digested yet. Did you feel like uh, the American government was surprised by this type of attack? I mean, some people have compared it to a 9-11, that it was a, a failure of imagination. Yeah. I mean, if it's a failure of imagination, I'm as guilty of it as anyone, in the sense that it's still not clear to me that there's a direct line between Russian behavior and Donald Trump getting elected. Um, you know, had uh, Russia backed Jeb Bush, would Jeb Bush have been elected? Again, I can't draw that direct line. To me, it's not a question of whether we lack the imagination. It, it, it's possible that Russia dictated the outcome of the election. It's possible they had very little influence. What's clear is that they tried to influence our election. They tried to discredit the system, uh, and we're not in a position to try and prevent that from happening again. Right. So that's, that's my next question, is that Putin says these are patriotic hackers who might right. have been involved, and this might have been sort of an organic thing that happened. Um, when. I mean, does it, is there any debate inside the government, and, and at what point is it clear that this is not uh, organic? Yeah. This is, these are state actors. Yeah, uh, I don't think there is any debate inside the government that clearly wasn't inside the Obama administration, that this was a directly organized and, and directed Russian attack from Vladimir Putin and the highest levels of the Russian government. Um, so there may be a debate about what we do about it, if anything, although if you listen to every Trump administration official who's asked, have you talked to the president about the Russian interference in the election? Uh, what has the president said? Uh, even Attorney General Sessions acknowledges he hasn't even received a briefing on uh, the Russian interference in the election. It's remarkable the lack of curiosity. Uh, and so the idea that somehow the Trump administration is going to be our best protector against prolonged Russian influence in the election, to my mind, is just nonsensical. I mean, to the extent that we are going to deter Russia from interfering with our electoral process again, it's going to take very strong deterrent statements and a willingness to order direct responses, whether that is political, economic, or cyber, uh, into Russian systems. And it's not clear to me that Donald Trump is ever going to authorize those sort of actions against Russia. Uh, once the, hot line, the risk reduction line is used and a message is sent, um, how did Russia respond, if at all? And secondly, the president himself told Putin at Hangzhou, mm -hmm. knock it off. Right. How, what was the response? And, and essentially about both cases, um, what kind of response did Russia give to these two? Videos? Yeah, um, you know, the, the response we got from the Russians on, the, on these two events was largely what we always get from the Russians, which is, we're not doing anything. It's not us. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what you're talking about. We would never interfere in your system the way you interfere with our system. Uh, you know, the, the, the non-denial denials. Um, uh, actually, not even non-denial denials, just straight out denials. We're not involved. It's not us. We would never do such a thing. Let me ask one other thing. Um, since you were there, you know, throughout the, the, the administration, was the Donald, was the Donald Trump, was the uh, Putin, uh, uh, the Vladimir Putin that, that, that you guys saw in 2009, how different or, or similar was he in, at the end? How, he, how did he evolve? Um, it's a great question. I, our perception of Putin may never have really uh, reflected what he was actually like. Um, we always knew that Putin was calculating. We always knew that he was going to serve his own interests um, before uh, being altruistic. He never did anything for the good of others. He was trying to ensure that he was in control of Russia and that Russia was in control of its destiny. Um, so in that sense, he didn't really evolve very much at all. What's, what's remarkable is that he became even more paranoid, um, more concerned about his control. The tighter that he uh, controlled all aspects of Russian power, the less confident he was. I mean, he didn't need to do the things he was doing. Uh, taking over Crimea was a tremendous risk. Um, he was much more secure in power in 2017, 16 than he was in 2009 or 10, and yet he still took those chances, which suggests to me that he really was never confident in his ability to control his surrounding and his circumstances. Um, it, at the same time, um, it is, uh, 
it's no surprise to me that uh, we ended up at an impasse with Putin. Um, President Obama has a very thick skin. He doesn't need to be loved by foreign leaders. It's always better if you get along with a foreign leader. But if there's real business to be done that protects America and that's also a win for Russia or China, the president's shown time and time again that he was willing to take those decisions. What I think stumped us was that there were clear wins on the table for Putin that he wouldn't take just because America was offering it. Um, Russia could still be seen as a leader in international nonproliferation affairs. Uh, they could still be uh, 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 engaged in uh, broader economic development. They could still be uh, participating in the G8, um, uh, much stronger actors in, in global economic affairs. It, it was really zero sum. If the United States is willing to suggest that there must be something wrong with it and therefore we don't want it. Uh, and they'd rather have uh, an argument with the United States than agree with us. Uh, and that's something that I think defines Vladimir Putin very well, um, that even if, um, even if it seems like a good deal, if it's coming from the United States, it's something he's not quite sure he wants to be a part of because he has defined his power, his influence, and his leadership of Russia as countering American influence. Uh, and you know, a, a number of us who grew up at the end of the Cold War are now asking ourselves, is this a new Cold War? Is this really where we're headed? And this isn't a global competition to take home all the marbles. This is much more of, a, of an arm wrestling match and back and forth that I think we're going to be engaged in for as long as Vladimir Putin is president. Um, and nobody's really sure how far it's going to go. What I can tell you is his paranoia became so extreme that we really worried about the ability of a conflict in Ukraine or Estonia or anywhere else to get out of control and to escalate very rapidly to the nuclear level. But we're still very concerned that the people around Vladimir Putin are not confident in their position and that things could get out of control very quickly, um, whether that's through escalation or through deliberate use. It's something I think we still have to be very, very worried about. Great. Thank you. Sure.